Hi, I'm the Tokenator, and this is Game Theory Impossible. Today we're going to be looking at one session that I played recently at 2 cent, 5 cent on America's Card Room. We're going to start off by looking at three different hands that are interesting and unique, and they're spots where basically I never find myself. So we'll take a look at those first, and then we'll follow it up with two interesting hands where I use the help of GTO Wizard to see how close what I did is to a proper game theory solution, or where I diverged, and if my divergence was in fact a good thing. All right, let's jump right in. So first hand we're gonna look at is a silly one. We have 10 deuce offsuit in the big blind. We get a limp from the button, a limp from the small blind, and we're gonna check our option with this garbage. We check and we flop top and bottom pair on a flush draw board. 10, 9, 2, 2 hearts. When it checks to me, we are not slow playing in this spot. Do not slow play in spots where it's a limped pot and you flop something big but vulnerable. There's no reason to slow play here. Nobody has ownership over the betting lead, so we just go ahead and pop in a bet. Here we're going to bet pot. We could even consider betting two times the pot sometimes. Anyways, big blind calls, and so to small blind, we see the seven of spades on the turn. Obviously, a straight of jack eight comes in, and maybe even eight six, but when it checks to me, I'm gonna barrel this again, probably for about pot, looking to get calls out of flush draws, top pairs, various other holdings. We bet 12 into 12, and the button folds. Small blind calls, and we go to a disastrous river. The seven of diamonds counterfeits us, at least one of the flushes didn't come in. I think it's very possible that Villain has a 10 here though. I think when Villain checks to us, we're just gonna have to check this back and lose a lot of the time. We check, and hopefully he was on a flush draw. He wasn't, he was on a open-ended straight draw, so something similar, and we end up scooping this pot. Next hand we'll look at, we have ace nine of clubs in the cutoff. Another strange spot. We open it up. This isn't strange because of this opening. I think this is pretty standard, but you'll see soon. We get a defend out of the big blind, and the flop comes 8 4 3 2 hearts. So far, so good. We flop over cards in a backdoor flush draw. When it checks to me on this kind of a board, I will be throwing in continuation bets against a big blind flat very often. Sure, they're going to have some pairs here, but there's a lot of turn cards that we can barrel on when he calls us on the flop. So we're just going to win this pot very often before the showdown. That being said, I check back. The reason that I check back here is because I timed out. And on America's Card Room, uh, they give you a, a disconnection notice whenever the internet gets funky. And so I was you know, counting down on that timer because the internet for that table wasn't working for some reason. So after about like 80 seconds, I finally timed out. And as a result, I became considered sitting out. Now when you're sitting out at the poker table, what that means is that if any action occurs, you will auto fold. That's important for this next part. So when the nine of spades comes out on the turn, villain now pro bets into us. Now, if you've been following the channel at all, you know that some of my findings at the micro stakes include a exploit that basically determined pro bets on the turn, especially when close to pot. Now this is kind of a small pro bet are generally very strong. We're talking two pair or better very often. With that in mind, our top pair, top kicker, against that general assessment is not looking great. We're obviously never folding. However, remember, in this hand, we timed out and we were considered sitting out up until the moment he bet. So I think it's very likely he was betting to try and steal the pot and therefore likely had nothing. But that nothing, what could that nothing be? It could be queen high, jack high, some kind of straight draw. So when facing this bet with our almost certainly good hand, but perhaps slightly vulnerable, we're going to put in a raise with that assessment. We put in a raise to 8.8 .8 and big blind takes a little while, but he ends up folding. So weird spot. I generally would advocate against playing back at any turn pro bets because they tend to be really strong at the micro stakes. But I had a specific situation here that just never happens really. Uh, but interesting to see how you can make adjustments based off of your specific situation. So I went against player pool tendencies here and made a play to protect my hand. All right, last hand that is kind of strange, but fun. 
We have queen jack of spades in the big blind. We're only playing three handed here. When the button folds, the small blind opens it up to three big blinds. And this is a spot where with a lot of hands, I like to just three bet and I like to three bet very small because I think small blinds opening range is going to be very, very large. And so we're gonna be opening small with all sorts of garbage and mediocre hands. We might make an exploit of opening huge with some of our really strong hands. The reason for this being that small blind is probably going to just fold regardless of the price we give him, unless he has something decent. So we can raise really big with really strong hands and get a call out of him when he's at the top of his range. In this situation, we're kind of in the middle. We have a nice hand that we'd love to see a flop with, but we'd also like to own the betting lead. So we're gonna throw in a three bet here and we're gonna do a very weird three bet. We're gonna three bet minimally to six big blinds and villain calls. We flop top pair on queen 10, six, two diamonds. We're gonna continuation bet here. And because of how small my three bet is, I'm not gonna do my general smaller continuation bet, especially with a made hand. We're gonna bet about half pot and villain does fold. Just a short, quick and interesting hand that took place. All right, in the second part of the video, we're gonna look at some hands that we're going to use GTO Wizard to help us solve, see what we did right, what we did wrong, where we diverged from GTO, and whether or not we like that divergence. So to start, we have ace, king offsuit, and the hijack. We're obviously opening this up. We get three bet right away by the cutoff, and when it folds back to us, we have a couple options. We can either just call out of position or we can throw in the four bet. Given it's a cutoff three bet against a hijack, it's not the strongest of three bet ranges. So I would honestly prefer to lean towards a four bet here. We do call, however, which I don't hate, but I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler. I think GTO hates this. Let's see what GTO thinks. Facing a cutoff three bet, this is our range to continue. It says ace king offsuit should be re raising always. <laughs> it's a pure re raise. Um, the only thing to consider is when we go all in versus when we small four bet. Notice here, look how dark that red is. That indicates with ace king offsuit, a huge percentage of the time we're actually supposed to just jam, which seems crazy to me. Now, a quick note is that the raise size here varies from reality. It takes a small three bet because the initial raise from a GTO point of view is smaller, but his three bet ended up being larger because my open was larger. So it might even be more reasonable, honestly, to throw in an all in here. Interesting to see. Ace King suited on the other hand, opts to pure four bet, but with the smaller size. So right away, we are not in line with the theory. However, we're gonna still use the solver, plug in uh, the call and see how the rest of our range would play in this situation. So the flop comes, ace of diamonds, nine of diamonds, three of diamonds. We flop top pair and the nut flush draw. We check and fill in continuation bets for 6.4 into the 19.4. I think we have a pretty easy call. Again, <laughs> we will never have ace king here according to GTO, but we do. But let's see what it has us do with comparable hands. So the closest thing we have to this is ace queen with the queen of diamonds. It really doesn't matter if we have the queen of diamonds or not. We are just not raising in this spot very often. We're only raising with our entire range 14.6% of the time. And that's primarily gonna be with what looks like queen high flushes and sets. So we have none of that. We do have a decent made hand as well as a great draw. So we just decide to call, even though I think raising could be uh, decent, not from a game theory point of view though. All right, the turn gives us the nuts with the two of diamonds and I decide to lead. So the reason that I did this is because doing recent study, something that I found from general GTO solutions and from GTO wizard video explanations of them is that the main part of your range that benefits from blocker bet leads tends to be nutted hands. The reason for this is because when you choose large sizings or when you go to check, you're just not guaranteed to make any money, especially when the board gets scary like this. When we check 
it's very likely villain will decide to check back. So my theory was that if I donk small in this spot, we may find some calls and villain may find a raise some portion of the time with some kind of bluff, thinking that this is a pretty weak play. Definitely is a weak play. I don't think I'm donking very often with this strong of a hand. I mean, we have the nuts here, but interesting to note, obviously we never have ace king here, but if we look here, when the two of diamonds comes out, we do have king queen suited. If we bet small uh, with the made flush, we're not losing that much EV compared to checking. Uh, but the important thing to note is that we are losing EV by betting from a GTO point of view. I feel like we're not necessarily because I just don't see villain barreling basically at all here unless he himself has a flush. But if he himself has a flush, he's going to call anyways. So betting here gives us the opportunity to be looked up by two pairs that might opt to check back and by, of course, any flush. So we've diverged heavily and villain does fold. I assume in this case, he had an ace at best, and he certainly had no diamond. All right, next hand that we have some GTO assistance on, we have king, queen of clubs under the gun. We're obviously opening this up six-handed, and we get three bet from the small blind. I think in this spot, that's a super strong three bet. If we had king, queen off, it's an instant fold. King, jack suited, it's a fold. I think in this spot with a suited ace, a suited king like this, king, queen suited specifically, think we can definitely call. I think we can even call here with like a queen jack suited. That might even be better because we're just less likely to be dominated. But king queen suited, I like call here. We call and we flop top pair on queen jack five. So far I think that the pre-flop was standard so we won't even bother with the GTO. But villain does decide to continue. He continues for 8.4 into 21. And with top pair, second kicker, I think on a board like this, we may consider occasionally raising. Let's see what GTO thinks. Against a bet, we are looking at primarily calling, rarely folding in position. We're doing a lot of floating, it seems. And then we're going to raise uh, occasionally. The raises seem to be, if we click here, primarily two pairs, sets, and over pairs. Uh, the pocket queens don't raise a ton, and that's because it's gonna be hard for villain to continue, I think, if we raise with our top set. But in this situation, we have king queen, and king queen suited raises the tiniest amount. The rest of the time, it's just gonna call. If we look at it here, the EV difference between calling and raising is pretty insignificant. So, like I thought, I think we can definitely raise here sometimes. And if we think that villain is gonna be continuation betting just too often. I think raising is reasonable because he's probably going to have ace king here, ace 10 here fairly often, maybe even ace jack, and we don't want to give that free equity. That being said, we're in position. It's not a big deal. If uh, we get to a nice turn and he checks, we can of course bet for value. We call. The turn is the six of hearts bringing in a flush draw and nothing else. When villain checks here, I think it's a mandatory bet from hero. Obviously, villain's going to be continuation betting a ton in that spot, and I think king queen's going to want some protection. In this spot, king queen suited bets about half the time. Uh, king queen of hearts is going to bet a lot more than king queen of spades and of clubs. We have king queen of clubs in this spot, but yeah, we can bet about half the time, check about half the time. In general, when I see a spot like this where the EV difference is very small between checking and betting, I prefer to bet. The reason for this is because at the micro stakes, people just don't raise often enough. So we just get the ability to bet for value much more often in a very imbalanced way. So with top pair second kicker, great spot to just bet. And we decide to check back. I think that this is a big mistake at these stakes. From a GTO point of view, it's not so bad, but from an exploitative point of view, I think that this is a huge error. I think that villain's gonna have a lot of ace X here that he's going to call, especially if he has something like ace 10, ace jack, ace X of hearts. There's so many hands we can get value from here. And if we bet and we get raised, I think we have an easy fold. Anyways, we check back. GTO says it's okay, I say it's terrible. 
The river is the ace of spades and that's why it's terrible. I'm not being results oriented or anything. Anyways, the ace of spades comes out. We are demoted to second pair and villain now bets pretty big, 25 into 37. And interesting. Basing this bet with our king queen suited, we're basically not supposed to fold. I mean, it sees folding a small amount. You can see that uh, the EV difference is not that big. Really strange to see that king queen of hearts all of a sudden just shoots up in value. That to me doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I feel like we would want our opponent to have the king of hearts here, but it says here that our EV with king queen of hearts is off the charts. If we call, we're looking great. If we go all in, we're looking okay. I don't get that. One of those weird solution spots. If you guys understand that, uh, please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to understand why king queen of hearts is so valuable here according to the, to the solution. Doesn't make sense to me. I don't see why king queen would be more valuable as a hearted variety compared to the clubs. If anything, I would prefer to have clubs because I'd want villain to have busted hearts here, king high. If we know that villain doesn't have busted hearts, king high, then it's more likely he has busted hearts, ace high, right? If we were hoping he had hearts before. So it's weird. I don't know if this makes any sense. I mean, it must, right? It's, it's a solution. But anyways, in the moment, I just asked myself, is villain ever bluffing here? And I think the answer is yes. But the next question is, how often? And I don't know. I, I really don't think that he's going to be bluffing in this spot that often, especially taking this kind of chunky sizing. I think when people bluff, they prefer to bet even closer to pot. This just seems like value. It's almost two thirds pot or something. So for me, it just really seems improbable. I mean, to be fair, we are slightly under repped. We didn't bet turn, but I just feel like king queen in micro stakes it's a simple exploit, just fold. We do decide to fold and we'll never know what he had. I'm pretty sure he had an ace, but uh, he could have also had something even stronger, who knows? Hi, it's Tokenator from the next morning. I ran out of time while filming this because I had to go to my real job, but I'm back and we're gonna finish this up with one more hand that was a little bit crazy and then we'll get into the session results. So last hand of the session that we'll look at, I have ace-king offsuit in the cutoff. We're obviously gonna open when folded two, and we get a tiny three bet out of the big blind. I think in this spot we can go both ways between flatting and re-raising. I'd have to be pretty convinced that Villain was doing this to get tricky to not four bet, I think, in this spot, just because they're inviting me to increase the size of the pot, and I have a premium. When my four bet comes in, I will retain control of the betting lead as well as not bloating the pot excessively. So for those reasons, I prefer a four bet here. We do four bet and villain calls. Now, when we look at the GTO solution for this, the bet sizings and pot sizings are gonna be different because of how unorthodox the line preflop was. In any case, we go to a flop of 10, 8, 2, 2 clubs. I think in general, connected 10 high flops are going to be pretty good in terms of just hitting the range of our opponent. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have a ton of strong hands like 10, 8. Of course, they will have pocket 8s and pocket 10s. I think in general, in a 4-bet spot like this, Villain is going to have a slight nut advantage but even still, I don't think they're going to have a ton of nuts. I think they're going to have pocket tens, obviously for the true nuts. But aside from that, they're not really going to have pocket eights very often when they get four bet out of position. So they're primarily going to have over pairs that are actually quite vulnerable and uh, don't see a lot of chance of improving. Villain might also have some over cards uh, that have some kind of strong backdoor draw. So in this spot, 
we can put a lot of pressure on villain by just doing our regular continuation bet and i don't think we need to bet very big because a lot of turn cards are going to help us barrel and also may just improve us to the best hand if we're not already we decide to continue for just about a third pot villain calls and we go to a turn of the seven of diamonds villain leads here and he leads for big half pot giving us about a two x raise behind slightly bigger than a 2x raise if we wanted to go over the top here now up until this point aside from the sizings i think we're going to be pretty in line with the solution here obviously pre-flop we're going to have a pretty slam dunk four bet here if you look here obviously the sizings are different it says raise to 28 but you can see ace king off is going to primarily be four betting it does call occasionally whereas ace king suited will exclusively four bet according to this solution i'm probably going to be leaning towards four betting uh just like this in fact i might just purely four bet when the flop comes 10 8 deuce when it checks to us the bet size that uh, the solver prefers is 5.65 again the bet sizings are going to be slightly different because I, i'm going to choose the size to continue uh, that is most prevalent just so we can see the largest node for the solution so as you see the pre-flop sizings are different than what actually occurred but I think the point is the same and the ranges are going to be similar enough that it'll be more beneficial to just stick to what is closest and then go from there so obviously we bet closer to like 14 but in essence we bet small and so let's just pick the small bet sizing obviously 14 is here as well you can see that uh, it's not used very often though so it's not going to be useful to examine that node so in any case we use the small bet sizing for the solution so we can see what happens in any case we're continuing as you can see here <laughs> with 75 percent of our range i translate that to 100 percent of my range when i'm looking at real life the seven of diamonds rolls off and when big blind donks again the sizings are off because big one is actually going to be donking here sometimes 20 percent of the time but uh according to the solution he should be using a 13.55 uh, in any case when we see what he's donking with uh, we see that it's pretty sporadic it's kind of all over the place but it seems to primarily be top set two pair and some good draws like nine eight where probably the nine and the eight are going to be decent outs because i'm not going to be sitting here with the jack very often and uh, pocket nines for open-ended straight draw again probably a nine is going to be a good out for him as well giving him a total of 10 outs and then he's going to be doing it with some of his weak over pairs like uh, pocket jacks and pocket queens pocket jacks is a little bit stronger here because it picked up additional equity i think than pocket queens in my eyes let's see here pocket jacks against my range is gonna have about 30 in equity yeah it, it's very similar even though pocket queens are technically stronger pocket jacks has some extra equity from the straight outs in any case not a lot of donking should be done here but when it is done it seems like it's primarily really strong hands and then some hands with reasonable amounts of equity that are likely not gonna like seeing uh, a big bet However, let's see what the solution says we should do when facing this bet. We should essentially never fold. <laughs> of course, this is because in the node that we're looking at, the bet size is much smaller. He actually went for half pot, so I'm sure we should be folding a little bit more. But in general, all of our hands here either have a fair amount of equity or are going to be able to snuff out whatever weird play is being done here on the river. So GTO prefers a huge percentage of calling here and a very small percentage of going all in. Notice pocket aces prefer to call as opposed to going all in. Kings start to go all in a little bit more. Queens primarily go all in. And the reason for this is because as you get from aces to queens, those over pairs require more and more protection. If villain is bluffing here, as we saw, he's gonna be doing it with some straight draws as well as a smattering of overcards. And a fair amount of these overcards are king high. So our queens are not loving it. So queens are gonna to prefer to go all in here. Another thing to note is 
Villain doesn't have any overpairs here better than Queens, according to this. So we're looking pretty good, especially when Villain donks. So in reality, when Villain donks here, my thought process is, is he ever bluffing? And does he ever have the nuts here? No, <laughs> he probably never has the nuts. He probably is doing this with something wacky like a straight draw or maybe a flush draw. Now, the problem is we have the ace of clubs, so we block one of the primary things he might be doing something like this with. But in reality, if he has a set here, I don't think he's really ever donking. So I think the general player pool is gonna prefer to check raise in these spots with sets. And whenever they do donks, it's usually gonna be somewhat of a capped range. That being said, I figure at strongest, villain here is gonna have like a 10, 10-9 10, suited for the open-ended straight draw top pair or something like that. And that might not fold, but it might. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't, we still have outs that are alive. Our ace is good and our king is good. It's reasonable, I think, to jam here. I think that he is gonna fold a lot of his hands here. I think he's gonna fold any eight, any seven. He might even fold uh, something like ace nine here that has a lot of equity that we're not really interested in giving a free chance to see a river and we're happy to get it all in right now. And he might even fold something like pocket jacks, pocket queens that obviously are not looking great against any of my value. But that being said, out of all the hands I could be bluffing with here, ace, king, off with the ace of clubs is probably the worst hand to bluff with. I do jam though, uh, because I like to make mistakes. And villain snaps us off. We uh, get bailed out on the river with an ace, and I'm pretty sure that that's gonna be a solid out because Again, I did not think that Villain had a strong made hand here, unless he has exactly something like ace-10 for top pair, top kicker. When we went all in on the turn, it exposed both of our cards, and it showed us our equities to win the hand, and you can see that Villain took his payout, which was 169 out of the 207. So you can see he had a ton more equity than us, and the reason for that is because he had pocket nines for an open-ended straight draw and a pair, so he was ahead with his pair and he had equity to improve to a straight on top of that. So he just had a pretty good lock on the hand. So we had a pretty decent read. If we had what we were representing, we were pretty much crushing villain here. We didn't. <laughs> we had just over cards and we sucked out on the river. Reasonably, I think villain has to call there given how little fold equity I had. If I was deeper and I made the same play, I think Villain should begin folding. So I think Villain played it fine. Uh, I think I definitely punted there, but we get super lucky and realize our equity on the river and both of us get paid because he takes his payout. So everybody wins. That's it for this session. You can see here in our results, we played for just about an hour, 316 hands, and we profited $4.84. So just under 100 big blinds of a win. However, it didn't really feel like a win. As you saw in that last hand, I basically punted off in a hand that was worth essentially the entirety of this win. So we can attribute the success of this session to a single bad hand, uh, which is not a good look. Next session, we are still not really playing our best, but we're gonna get better after that. I think part of the issue is that we're playing eight tables at a time here which is just a little too much for me at the moment. I'm still used to the knit strategy where I was playing a ton of tables just to get the volume as quickly as possible with a rather simple strategy. And now that I'm implementing my real strategy where I'm trying to be a real winning player, I think that I'm gonna have to dial back the amount of tables that I play moving forward. That's gonna be it for this video. If you liked what you saw or you hated it, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe or dislike, doesn't matter. And uh, I just want to give a special thanks to all the people that watched the last video. We got over 2,000 views, which was significantly more than a lot of the other videos on my channel. And it feels good because that video took a lot of work compared to some of the other videos on my channel. And it's nice to see the relationship between effort and viewership. I hope to get more of those kinds of videos out, but they are very effortful and laborious. They take a lot of time to produce that many hands for specific strategies. 
So I'll definitely be doing more of those in the future, but we're gonna be back to our usual content for a little bit, because at the end of the day, I'm trying to be a good poker player. I gotta hone my own strategy before I mess around with too many of these boxed in strategies like the knit strategy and so forth. But on the next strategy video, I think something interesting that I wanna try is experimenting with bet sizing. So maybe raising or opening really large pre-flop, betting super large on the flop as continuation bets, experimenting in that vein. If you have any ideas about what you'd like to see, feel free to leave that in a comment below. Uh, if you haven't seen the knit video, definitely check it out. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next one. Tokenator out.